And thanks so much to the organizers for the invite. I'm very excited to be here as well in today's session. Now, I've been asked, like you said, to do a, a short talk on methods for integrating the gender dimension in research. And in my presentation today, I will kind of introduce the gendered innovations um, project, which is an ongoing interdisciplinary endeavor that seeks to harness the power of sex gender and intersectional analysis for innovation and discovery. And in a nutshell, the core purpose here is to demonstrate how sex and gender can add valuable and new dimensions to research and innovation activities. But I think another uh, critical point which should not be forgotten is that sex and gender analysis can be critical in strengthening the precision and the validity of research as was also clearly demonstrated in Sabine's presentation on COVID. So the Gender Innovations Project has two general goals. First, it seeks to develop methods and approaches that enable engineers and scientists to integrate sex and gender uh, and intersectional analysis into their own research. But it also seeks to develop, as we've been talking about a little bit already, to develop these empirical case studies that help illustrate how the integration of sex, gender, and intersectional analysis can lead to new ideas, new perspectives, and better research. And that's, of course, also demonstrated in the case study on COVID by uh, Sabine and in Roa's uh, uh, presentation right now. And if you're not already familiar with the, with the Gendered Innovations uh, Project, I would strongly encourage you to visit the project's website. And if you look up Gendered Innovations in Google, it will be your first hit, hit I guess. Uh, and on the web website, you'll have access to an abundance of knowledge uh, on methods, recommendations also on how to best integrate gender and sex analysis in your own research. And it should capture uh, many different uh, disciplines. So I strongly encourage you to, to have a look at it and, and explore which aspects may be relevant for you. As we also already talked a little about in 2019, the European Commission asked Londa Schiebinger, who's uh, leading gender innovations, to put together a team of international experts to promote the integration of sex and gender analysis in the Horizon Europe framework program. And Sabine Roa and I um, are, were all part of this expert group and have in different ways contributed to the policy report that you see here, which is in accordance with the core principles, you can say, of gendered innovations. More generally, the goal is to develop tools and case studies to support the advancements of sex and gender analysis in the European research and innovation areas. And in this expert group, Sabine, I, and two other colleagues have the task of developing a common methodological framework to help researchers capture sex and gender dimensions in their own projects. And that's, uh, if you think about the diversity across disciplines in terms of methods, approaches, the questions they ask, this is not an easy task, but the goal was basically um, to sort of develop a starting point for people that are new to this approach. And um, the pie charts presented here kind of visualize the core logic of this methodological framework. Our goal has been to kind of succinctly summarize key aspects of sex and gender analysis at each step of a research process from the initial considerations of problem choice to the development of the methodological designs to the data analysis and to the reporting of results both in a paper and more generally to media and so on. There are important considerations regarding sex and gender at each step. And one of the principles of gendered innovations as an approach and an idea is that sex and gender analysis needs to be taken into account already from the very beginning of a research endeavor. So trying to retrofit sex and gender into a project at the end stage will rarely lead to anything useful. So as you can see here, we've developed a pie chart for both sex and gender. And these uh, um, pie charts um, have primarily been developed as an entry point into sex and gender analysis. So the purpose is to give these people that are new to the, to the methods a general overview of some of the most important questions to consider in each phase of their project. And the most recent uh, gendered innovations report published by the Euro Commission, European Commission earlier this year also includes a method on intersectional approaches. 
which follows this same logic. In this method, we also to kind of try to offer concrete suggestions on how to make intersectionality an integrated part of your research project from the very beginning of the where you select your problem to the reporting of your results. And here there's an even stronger emphasis on, you can see various forms of contextual factors that may be critical to take into account when you try to understand intersectionality and the intersecting forms of um, disadvantage and discrimination that are at play um, in this sort of analysis or key to this sort of analysis, you can perhaps say. So more importantly, I would say uh, the Gendered Innovations Project includes a number of field and discipline specific methods that provide more detailed instruction on how to consider sex, gender, and intersectionality um, in research. And in health and biomedicine, these field specific methods include sex and gender analysis in biomedicine and health research, sex analysis in research on tissues and cells, and sex analysis in lab animal research. And in sorry, um, in the domain of information and communication technologies, we cover gender and intersectionality analysis in machine learning and social robotics as uh, Roa was also just touching upon. And likewise, we have specific methods in the domains of climate change, also urban planning and innovation. Just as, and as part of recent updates, to the Gendered Innovations Project, we also kind of developed a method that outlined kind of the state of the art, you can say, approach for collecting data about sex and gender in surveys. And if you think about the usual way of collecting sex, gender information in surveys, it's via the, what we can call the one-step methods that is shown here to the right in the visualization. And the problem about this measure is that it conflates sex and gender and leave no response options for respondents that do not consider themselves to be male or female. Gender researchers are therefore increasingly, I would say, um, relying on the two-step approach to ask about sex and gender in surveys. And this approach asks about sex at birth and gender identity in two separate items in the questionnaire. And it also includes more inclusive response options for both the sex and identity questions. And um, the, the, this opens far more opportunities also for analyzing different combinations of birth, sex, and current identity that are critical to research in addition to being more inclusive. And I want to point out here that there's been some studies already considering and discussing whether there is a uh, drawback of using such approaches because it will piss certain uh, resp respondents off to some extent and they will not respond. But the empirical studies I've seen so far actually indicate that this does not scare respondents away. So it is an advantage to include this in, in, in sur survey research, for instance, in the health sciences or the social sciences. Finally, let me also highlight a few additional resources that some of you might find uh, useful. In 2019, there were three members of the Gendered Innovations Expert Group appointed by the Commission, Kara Tannenbaum, uh, Robert Ellis, and Londa Schiebinger. They published a landmark paper in Nature that I think compellingly outlines the potential for sex and gender analysis to improve the validity of scientific research and also to foster new discoveries. And this paper, I think, serves as an excellent entry point into the domain of sex and gender analysis. And more importantly, perhaps, I see the paper as a much needed reference that we can all point to when we need to convince colleagues, university leaders, or project partners of the importance of devoting systematic attention to sex and gender in scientific research. Because if nature acknowledges the importance of sex and gender analysis, they should too. So the brand in itself will help kind of emphasize the importance here and therefore it's a very important resource. Those of you that work in the areas of health and medicine may also want to check out our recently published paper on gender-related variables for health research and in this paper uh, Londa Schiebinger and I, together with psychologists and medical researchers from the US, South Korea, and Netherlands, tried to take a first step towards developing more fine-grained, more um, multi-dimensional survey measures of gender that can be used in clinical and population health research. And we, with this kind of um, 
develop, we develop the instrument in this paper and present the kind of initial results. We've tried to capture seven variables related to gender norms, gender related traits and gender relations. And um, the idea here is that these variables can be used to shed light on how specific gender related behaviors and attitudes contribute to health uh, and disease processes um, irrespective of or in addition to biological sex and self-reported uh, gender identity. So we need to capture um, um, gender and gender related questions and issues in more detailed way um, in, in health research through surveys. And, and this is what this kind of discussion we're trying to contribute with this new measure. So these were my points. I was just, I could uh, have just one question to you, Matthias, uh, and I think we can also think about that for the uh, discussion in the round table. You're talking about the methodologies and you had this good, uh, if it's pie or pizza or cookies, uh, what part would you say in that circuit is the most challenging? Do you have any experience with that? Is it, because is it when, do uh, is the challenge to start early enough in the in the design or in the procedure to ask to include the gender or do you see it falls out some uh, way in in this well tradi traditionally at least in the social sciences and health sciences people are good at asking this one step gender slash sex question and then including it as a control in their statistical analysis and i would say that um the challenge about this approach is that it more becomes something that you control out of. It's not something you devote attention to, first of all. Second of all, um, you may lose opportunities, for instance, of thinking about how gender may vary across all the factors and taking these things into account already from the start are extremely critical. In addition to that, um, the, the, the importance of thinking about this already when you identify the problem and early in the process is that, well, you need to also ensure that you actually have the data and the information you need to conduct robust and reasonable uh, sex and gender analysis. And if you, if you only include this kind of binary variable as one aspect, you will lose a lot of aspect. Another important question here, last point would be, um, which can be demonstrated with uh, some of the big health surveys is that there's sometimes sort of um, uh, hidden by gender bias kind of assumptions underlying some of the questions. Who's asked about, uh, uh, so, so some of the big surveys ask only women about uh, how much time they spend taking care of children and day, a day or something, stuff like that. So there's sort of things where we also need to challenge ourselves and think carefully already from the beginning, whether the, the instruments we develop, the, 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 um, the methods we choose and so on may have certain biases that will also kind of limit our sex and gender analysis. Yeah. Mm.